So the situation in Munich is that we are not in an entire lockdown since last Friday, but that there are very severe restrictions on being able to move in the public. So basically everybody is asked to stay at home and stay in their kind of units of home and stay with the people they are staying with and not meet with other people. But um, if it's necessary, you can still go to work. You can, of course, still do shopping. And then they encourage you to take a walk outside in groups of at most two um, to get fresh air or to practice sports or something like this. So companies are cutting the work time. They're reducing the time of work. So you go from 40 hours a week or like 38 hours to 60 to 80 percent and also your your salary goes down and there's a little bit of uh, social support from the state to to offset that salary loss what has started over the last days is to organize uh, neighborhood networks of solidarity so basically what we did two days ago so we recorded voice messages and translated them into different languages because the plan is now to get a van and you know put a loudspeaker on it and just to drive through the streets to let people know that you know if you need help if you need somebody to go uh, grocery shopping for you um, if you just want to talk to somebody because you're feeling lonely you know here's a telephone number you can call and we'll try to set up something for you today we found a, a website which looks very professional and it's kind of it looks very NGO like through uh, communication from from the organized neo-Nazis and it is run by neo-Nazis or by by right wing uh, university associations. I would say it's a in a way it's a symmetric activism because they, they have exactly the same idea. But then immediately you understand that they have not translated their website into different languages, of course. And it was, and that was like our first concern. But the general message coming from the authorities is that Germany is still kind of good or well prepared because there's a not an abundance, but quite a few of uh, ICU uh, beds, beds for in intensive care units. So they they place that at twenty six thousand for all over Germany, and which makes kind of twenty three thousand available for COVID nineteen patients. You know, intervention by the state is entirely back and is something you can openly talk about. The goal of uh, kind of driving up the profits obviously leads to infrastructure which is much less resilient or which has does not have extra capacity which might be needed in, in certain times. And I think this is something we should start thinking along. So you see, I, I feel that some major paradigms of neoliberal globalization or you can question them now like the long lo logistical supply chains they are definitely a weakness and now and there's something you can you also see you can't control and basically i think the argument that the market will fix it is not convincing to anybody in this very situation and i would be very interested to um, to have a discussion and then not only a discussion, but also to try to understand how we what we can do about it to get critical infrastructure back into collective hands. If you think about uh, climate change, I think a lot of the same uh, arguments will apply that, you know, economy has to become much more regional again and uh, infrastructures will need to be more well need to be able to absorb some kind of shocks and that some kind of overcapacity is necessary in order to address the needs of everybody and not just those that can afford it. I don't think it necessarily needs to go through the state, but um, perhaps we can also involve, it can, it can go much more through um, municipalities, which are much closer to an understanding, I think, of a commons than of an abstract public or population. And I think this is also where like if you if you break it down to to municipalities, you can't think population homogeneously and ethnically, like the Nazis are trying to do it, um, because it does just does not represent 
um, the reality and the composition of population in cities. I think I'm, I'm a bit amazed. I'm also a bit frightened by the entire absence of the European Union in this whole mess. Because usually, and there has been a driving force for, for Europeanization, uh, crisis has always been a driving force because it was always the argument, particularly of the Commission, to say, this is a crisis, this is something that a nation state alone cannot address, so we need to find a European solution. But if you if you look at the newspapers, also if you look at, for example, the the website of the European Commission, there's basically nothing happening at all. And the whole crisis response has been relegated to the nation states in ways that were not imaginable before. We were looking at the case of Bulgarian family members that were trying to enter into Germany because there are a lot of... Uh, workers from Bulgaria and also from Romania in Germany. Um, we had, for example, grandmothers come, trying to come to Germany to take care of the kids so that the families or the parents could continue to earn money. And they have been refused entry at the Frankfurt airport. They have been detained. Um, they have been asked or nearly forced to sign uh, voluntary deportation orders. EU citizens are not allowed or only under very strict conditions to move to other EU countries, this touches something very, very foundational and fundamental in the European Union. This might not be a temporary um, measure, but that, that this is something that will come back or will stay even after the, the corona crisis has um, subsided somehow.